Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, a place to find connection and a sense of belonging, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we talk about sensitivity and the richness that it adds, the strengths we have because of our sensitivity, and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. This is a little bit of a different episode for you. In the closed Facebook group, one of the members posted a question about how do I perform during an interview when I go into fight, flight, or freeze, and I can't remember what I'm supposed to say And I know my stuff, but I just am not able to answer and I don't respond in depth. So I asked KJ if she wanted to hop on a call with me and I asked for permission to record the call while we talked. And when we were done, really what you're going to hear is our unedited conversation. So this interview is not as polished sounding as most of my interviews. I did not have my recording equipment on because... I really wasn't recording a podcast interview, but wanted to record the session while we talked. So what you're going to hear is just a very spontaneous conversation that we have where we really assess with KJ, if you're not interviewing, do you have these skills? Are you able to articulate what they're asking if you're not under pressure? And then we talk about ways to use visualization, ways to articulate that we're deep thinkers and deep processors, and we may need a little bit more time to fully express ourselves. KJ had some concerns about how to express some challenges that she has with teamwork. Many of us have experienced that, that in a group, if it's a group that honors us, we do really well, but if we have to fight to get attention, that doesn't work. So how do we communicate what our strengths are and the challenges that we have in a way that really highlights what our strengths and skills are. We also talk about if you lose your keys or your wallet or your glasses frequently, how can you work on that? That ties into this sense of working memory of how can we articulate what it takes for us when we're learning new information, but our competence when we really get something down and our keen skills of observation that in an interview process may not be seen as strengths because we're not always verbal processors that think very quickly, but those strengths mean that we notice things and we may end up coming up with treatment plans and diagnoses that other people wouldn't because of these strengths that we have. So I think it's a really interesting interview. I'll be curious to know what you think about it, but it was kind of fun to hop on this call. And of course, I have KJ's permission to use this as an episode. Let me tell you a little bit about KJ. KJ McDaniels is a highly and energetic sensitive person based in Atlanta, Georgia. Having a love for the biological sciences, she studied molecular cell biology and immunology in undergraduate school. She is a small business owner in the animal field, future bovine veterinarian, multifaceted musician and composer, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, coloratura opera singer, and most important of all, a loving aunt to a five-year-old. She hopes to spread realistic and positive knowledge about sensitive persons through continual conversations. I I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. At the end, I'm going to hop on and give you a little bit more information. If you're enjoying the podcast, please share it with other people. Yeah, I have instructions in the show notes about how you can go to iTunes and rate and review. And now, on to the show. All right, we're recording. So KJ, tell me what I can help you with. Okay, so I've recently applied to veterinary school at Virginia Tech. And one of the stipulations is that you have to do an interview to get in. So this is called a multiple mini interview, and it consists of eight minute interviews. And they are based on several attributes that they're testing you for, basically. So like teamwork, integrity leadership, stuff like that. And so they ask you very random questions that you have no idea they're going to ask you. You have two minutes to prepare and then you have to go in there and razzle dazzle them for six minutes. And they ask you follow-up questions also. Okay. So what are your concerns? So I did it last year. I'm sorry, in January. It went okay. (laughs) 
But a few of the things that they needed me to work on was being more in depth. There was some questions I did poorly on, but I know being a highly sensitive person in that high arousal state, as I mentioned, my mind tends to go blank because it's in its flight or fight mode, basically. And I just, I need some help trying to circumvent the high arousal from preventing me to speak well or. Okay. I did a lot of practice. Um, I did all the research. <laughs> I have pages and pages about this interview on how to, to navigate it, but I still ended up on the wait list. And I think getting caught on the spot sometimes prevents me from really putting my point across. I also think I have ADHD. I haven't been diagnosed yet, but that's something I'm looking to do this week. But I've been doing a lot of research about that. And a lot of it points to me possibly having that. So I know that as well can prevent me from speaking as I as I could. I write fine. It's just from the brain to the mouth, there's like a block there. Okay. So I'm not familiar with the process. So when you said you're on the wait list, is that because you didn't do well in the interviews and so you've been put on the wait list? Yeah, I was on the wait list and it didn't move very much, but I didn't get the, hey, you got in letter. It was on the wait list. So that's over with. They selected all the students. And so I recently applied again a few days ago. Okay. And so if I get selected for interviews, those are in January. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the field that you practice in also. Have you had experience as like a vet tech or have you had hands-on experience? I've had a lot, plenty of hours, a bunch. Okay. I worked in veterinary ophthalmology for two years. I've had various internships. I actually went to a summer program at Virginia Tech for pre-vet students. I went to one at Michigan State. I had a semester at the zoo. I had a month at a large animal vet. I've done so much. So when you're under pressure and you're actually doing your job, does this impact your ability to respond in an effective way? No. Okay. So this really is about the high arousal rate and just kind of getting stuck because you get overly aroused and you kind of can't access the information that you need in your brain. Yeah, I'm pretty sure like if I know my job and I know how to do it well and I've practiced a bunch, it's like second nature. And you know, us people with ADHD, anxiety, I have anxiety also, we're ready for uh, traumatic events really because we've (laughs) anticipated them plenty. Right, right. Right now, I have a pet care business. I do a pet care and training. I'm used to being very vigilant and very aware of the animals and their surroundings and catching them doing things before they do them. Sure. So, yeah, I think that the biggest part is communication for me. Okay. It's, I was raised in an environment where my opinions and feelings didn't always matter. Yeah. These interviews, you really have to have an opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Big time. And if you weren't over aroused, do you feel like you have an opinion? Is it part of, I mean, there are kind of two things that if you go into that freeze or my brain is not working. Uh, Flight or flight. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, then obviously you're not going to be able to come up with an answer because you're in survival mode and your frontal lobe, which is your reasoning and logic kind of goes offline. So, right. So my first question is when you're asked these questions, Are they questions that you're able to answer if you're not over aroused and over stimulated? It really depends on if I feel like I'm in a safe environment. If it's someone I'm I'm with that I trust and we're just having like a deep conversation about opinions, I'm okay with that. Okay. Let's say I'm out with a group of friends and they're all talking really loud and all that stuff. And that's kind of, I guess you consider that a high arousal. So, but I know at those times it's really hard for me to to get my point across. Okay. Um, Especially if I don't feel heard. And that's, that's pretty typical. That's like, I just want to validate that what you're sharing is really typical. So what I'm hearing is you have the information, you have the knowledge, you have opinions, you are able to express yourself. It's that you get over aroused, over stimulated, and that prevents you from showing up the way that you need to be. And I, I really think that in the past, when you've had times when, you know, growing up, you weren't heard and seen when you're in larger groups, those are like traumas with a little T. 
it imprints on us. And what I'm seeing is that you look like you're almost a little tearful when you talk about that experience of not being seen and heard growing up. Oh yeah. That'll make me cry. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm just acknowledging that those are things that I think that if we can find some ways to work with that and what I heard you say is if you feel safe. So I think that the goal is to somehow create a way that you create safety for yourself in these environments that's what I want to do. I, I think that what happens is, you know, we put these people on a pedestal because they're holding something. They have the key to something that we want and we feel really powerless. And that kind of recreates that dynamic of I'm a child again. I'm not being seen. I'm not being heard. I have to prove myself. I have no value and worth, which is going to trigger flight or fight. And so I think it's about creating safety. Like you create a bubble of safety with you that, that you take with you wherever you go. And it could mean kind of, I think for me, I call it sometimes my task manager, that that's okay. the part of me that really had to show up to survive and the feeling part just couldn't show up. And there are times when that works for me and at times it doesn't. But my guess is that you have a task master too. I mean, we, we may call it something else, but that part of you that's really good at getting stuff done. Absolutely. Absolutely. When it comes down to it, especially when you're in that procrastination mode and the the deadline is coming up and you just somehow end up getting it done. You you have no idea how Yeah, Um, kind of moments like that, where you just have to get in there and do it and put the feelings aside. Yeah. And so this isn't about not honoring the feelings and it's not about any parts of us being good or bad, but it's about honoring all of those parts. But like the part of you that felt not seen and heard, we want to put her somewhere safe when you go to these interviews, because this is a a big thing for a little person. You know what I'm saying? It's huge. Yeah. 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 And so you can ask her, where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? I got this, you know, she may want to be with a friend of yours with a pet, if a ice cream store. I mean, I I don't know, but that, that part, we want to ask her where she wants to go, that she feels safe. And then we want to call on your taskmaster to show up because your taskmaster doesn't have those, emotional tangles usually. Oh, okay. That makes sense. You know, and it also means doing some work around visualizing yourself being there, the part of you that feels really confident that knows your stuff, really doing visualization about I've got this, I'm calm, I'm safe, I'm protected. Like, like this is kind of where you want to talk to that little part of you that feels frightened and what are some of her fears hear those fears. And then you want to turn those into, I got this, I'm capable. I know my stuff so that we kind of move from the emotional brain into our thinking brain. Okay. Because for this experience, you really want to be in your thinking brain because you know, this stuff, it, it means finding a way to access it and not getting hijacked into your emotional brain which, you know, you've got, you've got a little person in there that, that gets hijacked. And so we want to find a safe place for her so that you can be in your rational brain and you can rock, rock the interview. Yeah. Like the program director of the school, she said, we just want you to be yourself, just be yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my things going throughout life when I was younger was like hiding who I was a lot. Right. And she never really got to be developed. She's, she's, get, she's getting there. I'm getting there. Yeah. But I hit a lot of who I was from a lot of people. There'll be like select few who I said I feel safe with. You know, I don't mind bringing my personality personality out with, with a high stakes thing like this. It was, I tried to put a lot of myself out there, especially with teamwork. That was, that one was difficult for me, I think. Cause I find it hard to work with people sometimes and I don't always know what to say if they have a problem. I know there's a, there's quite a bit I need to work on, but as you said, if I can get to my rational brain and, you know, find myself a, a safe space within me, I think I'll be okay. Right. And, and let's talk about the teamwork because my guess is in general, we tend to be really good on teams. They may irritate us because they don't always operate the way we want to, but we tend to be really good listeners. We're really good about kind of wanting everybody to have a turn. I mean, are, are these things true for you? Absolutely. And, you know, if someone's not able to get their point across, I'll be like, hey, guys, listen, you know, listen to this person. So in some sense, I do t- try to take control in teamwork scenarios so we can get things done. 
And, you know, we, we definitely cater to the underdog. We have great ideas, you know, because we're always in our heads. But sometimes I don't feel heard. I remember a project I did in graduate school, and I pretty much created the whole topic that we did. And yeah ideas beyond that also. And some of them weren't acknowledged and that made me feel really bad, but in the end they ended up using them. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. So. I, I think that this is where we struggle when we're being interviewed because we tend to be really honest and we think about every situation and we think we have to bring every situation. And often as highly yes. sensitive people, we've had a lot of situations that haven't worked. And so kind of in the same way that we're going to compartmentalize we're going to talk about the things that did work for the for the purpose of this six minutes. We're going to talk about the things that do work. And you're really clear about your strengths, that you're a good leader, you're a good listener, you're really good about making sure that everybody feels seen and heard. You've got great empathy, great problem-solving skills. And so you really bring that sense of teamwork to whatever project you do. And again, you're going to need to compartmentalize like the experience that you just shared about where you did everything and you didn't feel seen and heard. We're going to just take that off the board that that's for another discussion, another time, and any group experiences that you've had that have been challenging, you want to take that off the board. And if they have a question about what do you find challenging around teamwork, you can say, I'm someone who really likes to think about things a lot and that I do really well when I'm seen and heard. And so sometimes the downside is if the group is very dynamic, I have to work really hard to put my ideas out. The flip side of that is, you know, this is where you're going to talk about your strength is I'm really tuned in because if I'm the one that has the leadership role in the, in the group, I notice if somebody's not participating and I really create space for them because having that level playing field is really important to me. That was beautiful. <laughs> so that's a way that you can take something that you struggle with. Like there's like a way that you can provide some education into what works for you. And I, I talk about being like an educated and empowered HSP. And so mm-hmm. these interviews are not about you providing, you know, your six minutes on what a highly sensitive person is. But right. I think there's a way that you can weave that in where you talk about it in terms of what your strengths are. Of I really like to think deeply and process about things. So sometimes I don't respond quickly because I'm really kind of chewing every side of the angle and it makes me a great troubleshooter, a great problem solver. But if everybody's an extrovert and they expect an answer right on the spot, it often looks like I'm not doing anything, but I'm doing a lot of deep work. I just need a little bit more time because I'm looking over every angle. That's very true. I love the way you put that as well. Um, yeah. Because that's, that's what I deal with a lot. And sometimes it takes time to get to the point where you can't think because everyone's talking. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. As you become really comfortable with what you're skills are, you know, they've been called deficits, you know, like, how come you can't show up? How come you can't tell us your opinion? How come, you know, you're so quiet? I'm, I'm projecting. Are those things that you've heard? Yeah, quiet, not on time. <laughs> yeah. And people are, I, I'm misunderstood a lot, I, I would say. Yeah. yeah. So as you learn about your traits, and you could educate people, you know, I'm not saying for the purpose of this interview, but if you go into a new, I don't know, would you have an internship? Is that what it would be? For, for school or, you know, for any type of group that you go into, what you can do is you can say, hey, listen, I'm somebody that takes a little bit longer to warm up. It doesn't mean I'm not participating, that I like to get the lay of the land and I'm really taking in a lot of information. If you are wondering about why I'm being quiet, you can ask me. Sometimes people misread my silence and think it's about something else. I'm just really kind of working all the angles. And so if you have any questions, please ask me because I'm really here and I'm open. Generally, people expect people to respond really quickly and spontaneously, and that's not how I'm wired. So, you know, my cake takes two hours to bake and not it's not something you can microwave. So you may need to wait a little bit longer, but you're going to get something great. You just, it, it's a longer process. Absolutely. I, <laughs> I would like to put that across to people just like that. Now that, yeah, now that I better understand myself, you know, I also dealt with epilepsy as a kid and Mm -hmm. that affected my memory a lot. And I thought my memory problems as a young adult were attributable to epilepsy, but now I'm seeing it's, it can be so many different things. Yeah. So my working memory can be poor. Yeah. On top of that. So it really takes me a longer time to, to get to the point. (laughs) Yeah. 
And with your working memory, my guess is that if you know what the routine is or you know what's expected and you learn it, you get it out of executive functioning and kind of into stored memory and it's not a problem. So again, is that correct? Yes. yes. Yeah. And so again, if you share about issues with working memory, then you want to add to that that says, but I've learned hacks so that I can get systems down and I know what I'm supposed to do. But what this may look like in the moment is if it's brand new information, I haven't had a chance to assimilate it. It it may look like I'm not tracking, but I am. Right. Yeah. I'm learning about HSPs and ADHD. I see that there is a lot of, a lot against me. So learning these hacks um, is something that I'm, I've been working on for the past few weeks because I just, I just learned about the ADHD probably a couple of weeks ago and I just started researching right then and there. And there are so many, so many things I can do to help, you know, as I said earlier, circumvent all these challenges. Yeah. And, and I'm not making a stand whether you have ADHD or not. Mm-hmm. As highly sensitive people, when we get over aroused and overstimulated, we don't function as well. And so if you put us in a quiet environment without distractions, we tend to do really well. Yeah. The same thing is also true for, you know, both of my kids have ADHD and one of them needs noise and music to work. And the other one, if you remove all the distractions, he does really well. So there's such a high crossover that sometimes it really takes someone who's very skilled to be able to tease out what it is, but with a, with a lot of things that are deficits and executive functioning with just planning and sequencing. So that's often like if you lose your car keys and you can't remember what time you're supposed to be places, you create a landing space. So when you get home, this is where your keys go. This is where your sunglasses go. If you carry a purse or a backpack, you know, this is the pocket that you always put them in. And and so what happens if you're on the phone and you're doing stuff, you automatically do that and it's out of executive functioning. And then you go to get your keys and they're right where you've already planned to put them. Yeah, that was the struggle for a while. I lost my keys in my wallet constantly. Yeah, so yeah. It hasn't happened in a while because I now have systems. Mostly. Right, <laughs> right. And, and those are the ways that we can override. And you and I even had a conversation today because this is not a time when I normally talk to somebody. And so mm-hmm. when I get home in the afternoon, I don't think about getting on a call with someone. So I said, yeah. you know, please send me a text and give me a reminder. I'm going to do everything I can. But I could see myself coming home and just getting into home mode because I (laughs) I don't do a call at this time. So what I know how to do is to say, this is really important to me. If I don't remember, please, you know, give me a reminder text five minutes before we're going to meet. But because I named it, I talked about it. I put it in my phone. I was thinking about it. You know, I texted you before we met and said, Hey, I got you at four (laughs) o'clock. So there's there's no shame in being able to say, I may need a reminder. This is what I struggle with. When we take the shame out of it, then we get people to assist us so that we can show up the way that we want to. Yeah. And shame is a, has been a huge part of my life, definitely. Yeah. And I still feel quite a bit of it, you know, asking for what I need or letting someone know, hey, I have challenges with this. So I'm just letting you know. It's been really hard to communicate that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And I know I can do that and still feel that. but at least know that I took some steps to let someone know. Yeah. That's the most important part. Yeah. And then, you know, the more often I do it, the easier it will get. Yeah. yeah. So if we go back to our original, so this interview that you have is to get into veterinary school. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. For okay. your program. Okay. If we kind of go back to where we started, are there any things that we didn't cover that might be helpful to discuss about what you might need with the interview process. Go ahead. (laughs) Oh, no, I'm thinking if you have anything else to say, that's fine. Well, what I was going to say is what I would suggest is I love before I go to bed at night, like that's kind of a time when I'm sort of quiet and I would start visualizing yourself going into these interviews. You know, you like wear something that you love, that you feel comfortable with, that makes you feel happy. You know, I always talk about fidget stuff that if you have, like I have a necklace that has loops on it. And so Mm -hmm. I can kind of twist it. If I need to, if you have a ring that you can spin, if you've got, you know, a sweater that kind of goes beyond your wrists, you can kind of use that as a texture to self-soothe if if those are things that are helpful when, because it's going to be a little high stress situation. So ways that you can fidget without being obvious about it. Um, Or if you have a bracelet, like I have a bracelet and it has a little loop on it so I can have my hands in my lap and twist this little loop and it's soothing to me. Okay. I do fidget a lot. So I think that makes sense. Yeah. 
that would be helpful to have. Yeah. And knowing that, you know, some of us that are neuro neurodivergent, like mm-hmm. we need to fidget to focus. You know, I, I do better if I am walking while I talk on the phone or listen to a podcast. If I'm just sitting, it's a lot harder for me. So again, learning hacks about it may mean standing up to do your work if you're able to, or, you know, having something tactile that you can play with. But what I would suggest is at night, you know, when you're kind of unwinding is imagine yourself going into the interviews and, you know, you're calm, you're confident, you're able to answer all the questions. If they ask you something that, you know, you feel stumped by, you take a deep breath and you pause and you tell yourself, I got this, so that you kind of start creating this sense of it's a situation that you can master. And so you start experiencing that before you even get there. Yeah, I did some some things like that. I did my breathing exercises, Mm -hmm. the power pose, if you've ever heard of that. Yeah. The super, super woman. (laughs) Yeah. You know, legs apart. If you don't know what we're talking about, you know, legs, legs uh, a little bit apart and you're, you know, it's, it's called akimbo. That's actually your arms are akimbo, which means, you know, uh, fists on your waist with your elbows sticking out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Head up, chest out a little bit. So you can run to the bathroom if you've got something you need to do. You don't have to do it before you start presenting, but run to the bathroom and do your power pose. (laughs) And that's exactly what I did. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of it could be my anxiety around this. You know, I'm sure I did fine. I ended up as number 18 on the wait list. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they chose 120 of the students and then Mm -hmm. I was what 140, whatever. And that's, that's not horrible, you know? but I tend to put a lot of pressure on myself. Yeah. But now that I know some of these facets of me, um, I think another part of it is going easy on going a little bit easier on myself too. And I think that'll bring me some comfort as well. And it's also really a system that, that rewards people that are extroverted and that are verbal processors And it really is punitive to introverts who tend to need time to think about things and really want to formulate their answers. And then you add being highly sensitive on top of that with the over arousal and the overstimulation. It it really is not a system that honors how everybody is wired. It really favors the extroverts. And I was I was thinking about mentioning that to the um, program director. Like we talked on the phone after all the applications and interviews were all done and she let me know how I did. So I have a a relationship with her, you know, in Mm -hmm. a way I was thinking of, you know, mentioning that to her just so she can have that in consideration. I know it's not going to change anything per se. They're like, this is the best way to gauge whether someone would be good for our program. But there, I'm like, there are some outliers like me, you know, I might be great for your program, but because this is the way they have to construct this program, I might not be chosen. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the truth is the advantage for them choosing folks that are highly sensitive is those folks are going to really think about the animals, think about the outcomes, think about everything and come up with, it may be an even better course of action and treatment because of that depth of processing and taking in way more information that we may notice subtleties in the animals that a non-HSP wouldn't. And so they may be inadvertently weeding out people that potentially would make excellent vets because they're not aware of the neurodivergence and, and how they're kind of favoring extroverts. That's very true. So I don't know if that's a good thing to bring up or not with her. I'm still gauging, of course, (laughs) still gauging whether that would be appropriate or not and how I would even present it. And it's not to change their program, but just to, bring some knowledge to her because when I spoke with her, I just learned about my anxiety and I've given it a definition. I'm not labeled by it, of course, but it's a big part of my life. I now realize why I do certain things. And one thing that I brought it up to her and one thing she's like, she's like, I don't struggle with anxiety at all. So there might be a lot she doesn't know about neurodivergent people. Yeah. And she's the one forming these questions and running this program the way it is. Right. Um, and I, I do think she would be extremely understanding. Um, yeah. Just trying to see whether or not I should do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and again, with the anxiety and again, uh, you know, people have diagnosed anxiety. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but I thought I had social anxiety. I was 
I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. I thought I was an introvert. And, you know, it turns out I don't have anxiety. I don't have social anxiety. I don't have depression. I'm not an introvert. That for me, so much of it was hinged around kind of the, my, my mom not understanding what I needed as a kid as a highly sensitive person and feeling like there was something wrong with me. And then we get in these environments where we feel like we don't fit in. We feel like who we are isn't okay. We're kind of wired to notice things and to anticipate things. So I do tend to run on the anxious side. I, I will imagine the worst outcome for things, but like I go like, oh, I'm going there again. So do I really know that that's what's going to happen? So I'm not trying to convince you that you don't have anxiety, but I'm just sharing that even with being a highly sensitive person, when we understand about our traits and how we're wired, we have ways to work with it. And what you may be experiencing as anxiety now as you learn more about your trait may end up not even being an issue later on. I mean, if it is, do what you need to do. I'm, I'm not telling you to dismiss it. I want to be very clear about that. Right, right. No, that completely makes sense because it's just what you said about your mother. She just wasn't equipped for yeah. what you needed. And it caused you to feel like a, a, a weirdo, you know? Yeah. I mean, what I hear from HSPs is we feel like we're the misfits, we're the truth tellers, we're the black sheep, we're the outliers. You know, we're only 20% of the population. And the role of our parents is to really teach us how to honor how we show up in the world. And by doing that, they teach us how to manage the feelings that we have. But if we have parents who don't get it, which not many people do, and it's not that they're bad or they're wrong. I think they're very well intentioned. Then we don't know how to manage these strong feelings that we have, these strong reactions. We don't learn how to calm and kind of self-regulate. And so we end up being called dramatic and picky and all of these things because we weren't taught how to manage it. And then we feel like there's something wrong with us. And it's just about learning more about how we're wired and learning those tools and kind of go back and giving ourselves what we need so that we can really show up in the world in a different way. We're always going to be highly sensitive, but we really can learn ways to manage and have a much bigger life than we might be able to have when we don't understand. How can I um, practice putting my opinion out there without sounding controlling? because that's how I was raised. <laughs> I was never able to really make decisions for myself. So I, I struggle with decision making. Mm -hmm. So it's either hands off of making a decision or sometimes being overly controlling of other people. My teamwork question, it was an acting scenario. Mm -hmm. So there was someone who came up to me and said, hey, I've been having trouble in our teamwork session. I feel like no one's listening to me or, you know, it was something like that. And my answer was, I'll talk to them. I'll take care of it. Mm. They wanted me to say, how can I help you? How do you think I could help you with this? Yeah. You know, so I saw a lot of my mother coming out of me. When, yeah. Yeah. When um, that occurred, I've noticed myself, I look back and I noticed myself doing that quite a bit. So it's kind of like, I need to work with people instead of above them and uh, trying to give unsolicited advice. <laughs> well, and it's interesting that, you know, you express that desire of being seen and heard, mm -hmm. which is if you were the person that were coming to somebody else in that situation, what is it that you would want to tell yourself? I, I like that answer. Like, how can, how can I, how can I help you? Kind of like how you presented it today. How can I support you, you know, with your presence here in this group? Yeah. Um, my mind just went straight to, I'll take care of you. you well, know, that makes sense. My original. Yeah. We do what we, we do what we, what we've been taught. So yeah. you didn't know that there's a middle ground. And so this is kind of like, so that's the taskmaster. I'll go fix it. Yes. And, and generally like my taskmaster lacks a lot of empathy because she just wants to, you know, get things done. Oh. And so, you know, the empath, the, the empathic part is, gosh, that sounds really frustrating. That sounds really hard. That sounds really challenging. What is it that you're needing? What do you think would make it helpful for you? What do you think you're need? You know, that you, you can pose it back as a question. And if it comes to a point where you need to make a decision, I love the, I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering what it would be like. What do you think about? I say that I do a lot of I'm wondering. So in other situations, but I can move that to that too. Yeah. Yeah. That's more of like a suggestion in a way that opens the door to be open-minded, I guess. Well, and it's, it really puts the responsibility back on the other person. And I'm not making a declaration that I know what's right, but it's like, 
we bring that mindful curiosity into it. I'm curious about this. Help me understand. Tell me a little bit more. I'm wondering what would it be like? And, and it's very tentative. That's not a way I think very often because I've been raised with an I know, I know, I know parent. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, is that working for you? <laughs> no. Yeah. And when I hear it from others, it kind of not triggers me, but it's just like, <laughs> yeah, it makes my eye twinge a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can, I definitely see how um, I can make a lot of effort to put the responsibility back on someone else so we can work together to find the common ground. Yeah. That's just not something I was exposed to very much. Yeah. You know, and this is all about learning new ways of being. And so it's okay that you didn't get these skills. It's about getting them now practicing, getting support around it, having lots of self-compassion and knowing that, you know, you're going to do it. It's going to not work. It's going to work. It's going to work this time and not next time. And that that's okay. Yes. That's part of the process. It's not like, oh, I learned it and now I'm done and I'm not going to struggle anymore that, you know, you're in the process and the goal is to be in the process, which is what I call the messy middle where we're trying, we're figuring things out. We stumble, that's we fall, we I get am. up. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, that that's really okay. We're so goal oriented, but it's really okay to be in that place of like, I don't know. And I'm just trying to figure this out. I, lo- I love that. I didn't get into school. Honestly, I been using this time to really get to know myself because I don't feel like I I truly did know yeah. who I was and that's not a person who should be in a school that's you know really requires you to do all this rigorous study and when you break down because you can't learn something you have to be able to soothe yourself definitely right. and that requires knowing yourself right I'm glad I went through that situation so I know what what it's like right um, now I think I, I can definitely be stronger than ever. And I love talking with people like you that can definitely help push me in a new direction and think differently. Yeah. So it may not have been a no, it may have been a not yet. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 That's what um one of the veterinarians there said, you know, I'm 32 right now. Mm-hmm. And I I've been I was setting up meetings during my summer program with all these the, all the speakers just on the side. And I was talking to one of the veterinarians. She was the first black woman to graduate from that school. And she came back. She was working at another school. She came back. So this was her first week back. And she, I told her my story. She's like, maybe you should take a year off. I'm like, I'm 32. <laughs> I, I've taken many years off. I think this was my year off. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is there anything else before we wrap things up? I'm very grateful. Oh, you're very welcome. Hey again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I really enjoyed having this spontaneous conversation. And from the work that I do with other HSPs, I know that KJ's concerns and the things that we talked about are really common for many HSPs. So I hope you found it helpful. A little bit of an update. KJ said she's going to be posting in the closed Facebook group. She has some pretty exciting things that are coming up and took a little twist and turn. So I'm going to let her share that with you in the closed Facebook group, Unapologetically Sensitive. There are a couple questions that you need to answer in order to join the group. If you're interested in seeing the show notes, if you want to contact me, you can go to unapologeticallysensitive.com, click on the podcast page and click on KJ's episode for the show notes and any other information that you want or to get more information. The new round of online HSP courses is going to be starting again in April if you're listening in real time because people can listen to these episodes anytime. The best thing to do is to go to unapologeticallysensitive.com and click on the HSP groups page to get information about the HSP groups. One of the things that, and I feel like I'm really messy with my words, one of the things that I'm seeing is We often show up in the world with these wounds and we don't know that we have these wounds. It's like wearing a pair of glasses and this is how we see the world, but we don't know that we have a view that's a little bit limited. The best example I can give you is I I buy these skincare products through this company that I really love. I've been working with them for a long time. For the last two months, when I receive my orders in the mail, the product has not lasted as long as it should. It's only lasting half as long and they just changed their packaging. So last month I called and I explained and they sent me a replacement bottle and I was happy with that. This month, the same thing happened. And because 
I, I keep track of when I start using the product and when I finish using the product because every once in a while there's been an issue, but for the most part, it's been fine. I love this product. So again, this month, it only lasted half as long as it should have. And when I contacted customer service, I did it through chat. I probably should have called by person. What came up for me is they're going to think I'm scamming them, that I'm just trying to get free stuff. So I have these glasses that say, you can't trust people and they're either going to think that you're ripping them off and the flip side is they're trying to rip me off. So I have these glasses that believe that when things don't work out, either people are not going to believe me or they're trying to take advantage of me. Because I'm aware of this bias, I noticed it in my chat, I was being a little confrontational. And so I said, it's not my intention to be confrontational with you. I, I just am frustrated about this. And so because I had that awareness that this is something that's activating for me, when, when this happens and I have to assert my needs, I really wonder if I'm going to be believed. So are they going to believe me? And then if they don't believe me, can I trust them? And so I had a conversation with the person who is the rep for this product that I've known for years. And again, I had that feeling of, I know that she knows that I wouldn't be making this stuff up, but she had reminded me of, thank you for being patient with this. And because I've been ordering this product for a few years, she can look and see that this is not something that I do every month. But because this is an area where I get activated, it's really challenging for me because I know that it's challenging. I'm able to name it. I'm able to talk about it. If I didn't know that, every time something happened, I would flip into this kind of angry, not trusting type of person. And what I see happening in the group is when we have like a wound of being too much, somebody will share and say, I feel like I'm asking, I'm taking too much time. And I'll say, do you want to get a reality check? inevitably everybody in the group says, no, it was fine. I really learned something. I, I experienced that, but I couldn't have put that into the words. I, I love how you expressed yourself that it's through the way that people interact in these groups that we really get to see like, oh, so not everybody thinks that I'm too much and there is time and room for me. So it's a very simple example, but it, it can really be powerful when we don't even know that we have these ways of viewing the world, viewing ourselves, and we're able to see that we're having a really different experience being with a group of other people in a really safe environment. If you're interested in the groups or you're interested in working in individually with me, I offer a free 20 minute online consultation. Again, unapologetically sensitive.com. You can reach out by email to me there if you have any questions or comments. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being such a dedicated listener. I really appreciate each and every one of you. I hope you have a blessed day. And remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. Mm-hmm.